Good evening. Turn off your welcome. Cell phones. Turn off your cell phones. <laughs> welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Harvey Ashinsky in support of Scratching the Surface. Uh, first, a quick overview of webinars for those of you just joining us. The chat is closed, but you might want to keep that chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Scratching the Surface from Literati. There is also a link to purchase books in the description below if you are watching us later on YouTube. But if you're watching this live, you can submit questions for the Q&A portion of our evening uh, using the Q&A feature available to you in the webinar at any time. And I will read a selection of those questions to Harvey at the conclusion of his talk. Uh, as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup. If you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming, whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our events, or say our YouTube channel, if you're watching most of our events there, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where or in when in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's author uh, and the book we're all here to celebrate. Harvey Oshinsky is a writer, producer, story consultant, educator, and public speaker. Scratching the Surface, Adventures in Storytelling is a deeply personal and intimate memoir told through the lens of Harvey's lifetime of adventures as an urban enthusiast. He was only 17 when he started The Fifth Estate, one of the country's oldest underground newspapers. Five years later, he became one of the country's youngest new news directors in commercial radio at WABX-FM, Detroit's notorious progressive rock station. Uh, both jobs placed Obshinsky directly in the bullseye of the nation's tumultuous counterculture of the 1960s and 70s. When he became a documentary director, Obshinsky's dispatches from his hometown were awarded broadcasting's highest honors including a National Emmy, a Peabody, and the American Film Institute's Robert M. Bennett Award for Excellence. But the memoir is more than a boastful trip down memory lane. It also doubles as a survival guide and an instruction manual that speaks not only to the nature and need for storytelling, but also, and equally important, the pivotal role the twin powers of endurance and resilience play in the creative process. He can't hear you, but he can, he can sense you through the powers of Zoom and the internet. So please join me in a round of applause and welcoming Harvey Ovchinski into your living rooms. Harvey, take it away. Thank you, John, very much. I really appreciate uh, you and Literati inviting me to uh, talk about scratching the surface. Um, this is like a reunion for me because um, last time I was here, where, where are we? At Literati, not fair there <laughs> was several years ago when um, I was asked to talk about uh, the book about my father, uh, the, uh, the man who saw tomorrow, uh, the life and inventions of Stanford R. of Shinsky. And that was a hoot. I love talking. I, I miss talking in person, but I'm used to being um, on the radio. So I can do this. I'm used to being in the classroom, so we can do this. Hello, friends. Hello, family. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm really excited. You know, I, I've this has just been my idea of a good time. Writing was hard. Um, I've been dying to talk to someone, anyone. It's been four years since I started writing Scratching the Surface. So I am really indebted to you for giving me the opportunity to spill my beans about uh, my work, about the process, and about creativity and storytelling. And thank you again for John and uh, Literati for inviting me. I thought I would start. Um, by reading an excerpt from the book. Um, and it's really only natural because one of the most frequently asked questions I've been asked um, when the book has recently just, was, just came out um, in middle, well, March 9th, um, the most frequently asked question I've been uh, approached with is why a memoir? Uh, that's a first. I mean, you're used to telling everybody else's story. Since when did you start telling yours? And the answer is, that's the point. <laughs> that's the point. So I'm going to answer the question, why a memoir? Uh, and why now? By reading an excerpt from the book. Okay. An excerpt. I'm not going to read the whole preface. 
at the uh, MacArthur Foundation, they call it the big C, but you don't have to be a genius to be creative. In this era, era of mindfulness and today's preoccupation with um, pursuing a meaningful life, the New York Times wrote an article about this, creativity has become a new antidote to cure the doldrums of midlife. Uh, who needs a Ferrari, the Times asked, when you can pick up a paintbrush? Or in my case, find the words on yours to tell our stories. In retrospect, I wrote in the preface. It makes perfect sense that I found my words early on, as John said, when I started the Fifth Estate and later on went to work at ABX. Um, I've always enjoyed, uh, whether I got paid for it or not, working under the radar and scratching below the surface. It's just, um, it's just what I love to do. And I'll tell you why. No, scratch that. I didn't mean to say that, but scratch it. I'll show you why. This is where the title comes from. So, hmm, what is that? I can't hear you. A little louder. Yes, it's a line. Thank you. It's a straight line. Yes, absolutely. And um, what I want to say, it's also a, um, literally it's a line, but metaphorically, it represents as a symbol for the surface. Surface. It's the surface. It's your nemesis. It's your enemy. This is the uh, any creative person's worst enemy. Because why? Because nothing's new about the surface. What you see is what you get. It's also easy. It's also safe. Uh, no bombshells above the surface. It's all been said and done before. No surprises. Okay. But below the surface is what I call, and forgive me if you've read the book, I'm being redundant. It's called the good stuff. The good stuff. And the question is, or well, the good stuff, it's who we are. It's the heart of our matter. It's our soft spot. It's what matters to us. It's what's important. It's what we value. It's what we care about, regardless of whether anyone else is interested or not. So the question is, how do you get past the uh, know nothing surface, through the surface, into the good stuff, so that you can be reunited with it and feel free and uh, brave enough to share it and show it with others? How do you get from the surface to the good stuff? Easy. Should I do it again? No, it's okay. We won't. All right. <laughs> yeah. So hence the title. Okay. Now we know. In case there were any doubts, you got to scratch the surface. You got to dig. Um, you got to burrow. You got to go deep. You got to go far. Um, if you want to be able to share the best part of yourself with others. And for that matter, with yourself. Sometimes we, our good stuff is so sensitive. Uh, it doesn't even want to reveal itself to you consciously. You have to really scratch your surface, your own surface to get to it. Okay. So um, it looks good on paper. It sounds good. My fourth graders hated it at the Gross Point Academy. Uh, and some of them I know are watching and listening. I'm sorry if I'm giving you post-traumatic stress, guys, but that's how you get to the good stuff. Okay. Uh, it looks good on paper or on blackboards. Well, it used to look good on blackboards. There are no blackboards anymore. It's only whiteboards. And you can't do this on a PowerPoint presentation. Scratch the presentation. Um, but some services are harder to crack than others. Okay. Which brings me to the preface yet again. I want to continue talking about the origins of this story and this book and this memoir by going back to the preface. It's just an excerpt. It's not the whole. In 2004, when the Detroit International Film Festival, uh, the Detroit Docs International Film Festival, uh, awarded me and honored me with a Lifetime Achievement Award. I was touched. I was honored. I was gratified. And the Metro Times, the Detroit Metro Times, was very generous when they described my work in print and on radio and on television as being, what do they call it, a colorful and fantastic journey, at times brave and visionary. Oh, I I thank them for it, but that wasn't entirely true, okay? Uh, that wasn't the full story and, and I knew it. Um, I had a knack, uh, a gift actually, 
for being able to ask the right questions and get the right answers, even from people who didn't want to share their good stuff. But I thought it was important for their sake and mine to share their stories. And uh, in order to do that, you have to ask the right questions and have to know um, when to uh, when, when, when too far is too far. But after so many years of spinning so many of my yarns <laughs> with other people's threads and all these docs and all these radio talk shows and you know, at the Fifth Estate, I was beginning to feel something was missing. Something was a, a, a hole. It wasn't the good stuff, it was the other. It was a hole, something was missing, a voice missing from my storytelling. And I wanted to do something about it. There's an irony here, I admit it, because for those of you who know me, friends, family, students, especially my students, know that um, I've lived my professional and creative life in italics. <laughs> uh, my outside voice is very brave, very passionate, energetic, and in fifth gear most of the time. But when it comes to sharing my inside voice, who is this guy? What's he about? I know his work. I know him by reputation. I read his newspaper. I listen to him on the radio. In my classroom, I was always Mr. O, whether it was my graduate students or my fourth graders or, or whatever. But um, I kept myself to myself on a personal level uh, for the longest time, for the longest time. Uh, my mantra, and it was very confusing to my colleagues at Channel 4 and WXYZ TV and Detroit Public Television, um, because I was very comfortable um, asking complete strangers to sit down and have them spill their innermost beans for me. You know, you, you, you show me yours, but don't expect me to show you mine. And I, I, after a while, despite the awards and despite the honors and despite the accolades, I started thinking it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair for me because I was using my questions and their answers to tell my stories. And that was a cheat. And as I approached my 70th birthday, I really wanted to do something. Plus my friend, Michael Kerman, who was with the Fifth Estate, one of my best friends, <laughs> um, used to say, you know, I, I, the newspaper and the radio and the screenwriting and the teaching and, and, and all that. I've never, I've never written a book, which was an invitation for me to say, yeah, well, I can do that because as Mike said, when was the last time I ever did anything twice? For better or for worse professionally, for, the, for better for the most part. So I, I wanted to stretch some muscles and that's why I wrote the book. Um, I don't want to say, the thing is, it's not what I'm talking about. It's not just for artists and writers and creative people. Genius is certainly not. It's for anyone who feels like, and I say this in the book, and it was written for people, civilians, I will call you guys, or them, for people who, anyone who has something important to say, something necessary to get off their chest, to get off their chest, to speak their truth, and then just need a little help, a little boost, a little encouragement to find the courage it takes to scratch your surface because you it's not there accidentally. It took you a lifetime to build that, construct that surface. The great wall from Gangnam of Thrones is nothing compared to the walls and the surfaces that we construct for ourselves to protect our good stuff from the outside world, to protect, protect us from them, okay? Um, my fourth graders used to love it when I would um, <laughs> I would pinch my skin. Let's let's be fair. I would pinch my skin, and I would ask them, "What is this? What do we call this? The largest organ in our body? What's it there for?" And they would say, "Well, because they're smart when you're fourth and fifth graders. <laughs> it's skin, Mister O. It's skin." And and I say, "Well, you're right. How observant. But let's reflect on this." What, what, is, what good is skin? What is, it, what is its purpose? Why is it there? Why is it essential that we wear our skin on the outside rather than on the inside? And they all said, because it protects the inside. I said, that's fine. <laughs> Smart kids. Yeah. But then I asked, what would, I, what would happen to us? What would happen to you? What would happen to me if uh, we shed our skin, metaphorically, our surface? 
our protective surface? What if we shed it? What if we didn't have any more skin to protect our uh, precious inner organs <laughs> from damage? And this is the fun part. They knew what the answer was, especially those of them, especially for fifth graders, because they remembered the lesson from the fourth grade. We all got up. They got up. What would happen if we uh, uh, revealed our good stuff and, uh, and uh, didn't have the skin to protect it? We all got up and, uh, well, I can't show you because I'm, I'm on Zoom. They all got up and they squashed. <laughs> they, they, they saw their good stuff. They put their good stuff on the floor where it fell out. They spilled their guts on the floor and they stepped on it because they knew that's what would happen. They feared if they shared their good stuff, if they spilled their guts and nothing or no one was there to protect themselves from uh, the uh, ramifications of that. So I will say again, to answer your question, how could I not write a book? How could I not want to explore this? Uh, I used to have vitamins in, well, for fourth graders, fifth graders, eighth graders, graduate students at Wayne, my students at the creative um, CCS. Um, well, it, does, it didn't make any difference how old you were. The issues are still the same. And um, what do I want to say about that? Well, I want to say that the issue of protecting and shielding ourselves um, from exposure is something that is very um, important to us. Or not. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe I'm making this stuff up. Maybe you're the exception and you don't need to spill your guts or share your good stuff or reveal who you are to anyone. Um, but I wanted to find out what kept me from, to, from spilling mine, which is why I divided the book into four chapters. Where is the book? Poor Wayne State University Press. Um, they said, oh, Catherine Wildfong, you remember this, Catherine? Uh, she said, oh, Harvey, we'd love to print this, but it looks like four books to us. Print, radio, television, screenwriting, teaching. Where do we start? And I said, well, let me give it a, 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 let me have a crack at it. So I wrote a book in four parts rather than writing four books. And this goes back to the original question. What, what I want to do is where did I go wrong? That's a value judgment. How did I lose my voice? Did I ever have a voice? What happened? Did, I, did someone take it? Did I give it away? Was it any good in the first place? Maybe it was a good thing that I kept quiet. So anyway, the first half of the book is called My First Childhood. I love writing these titles. The first half is called My First Childhood, which really exposes and reveals. I generally hate in memoirs. Uh, I usually skip over the childhood stuff because I want to get to the good stuff. I want to get to the juice. I want to get to the gossip. I want to get to the celebrities. I want to get to the what brings me to the table. Not. I don't care about your childhood, Harvey, unless it speaks to my, ah, unless your childhood speaks to mine, which is another point of writing the book. I didn't want to write a, I wanted to write a memoir. I didn't want to write a selfie. Okay, so I knew for a fact, because I teach this stuff and you know what I'm talking about, because I can see you nodding and taking notes and shaking your head, um, that nobody cares about our stories. Nobody cares about our good stuff. Not really, unless, but unless you can find a way to make your story feel like mine. Make your story feel like theirs. Your good stuff feels like their good stuff. Then you're in business. Then it's safe. Then it's not just a selfie. Uh, the ironic thing about creativity and writing and self-expression is the more personal and intimate your work is, the more universal it is. The more universal it is. Okay? So that was my goal not just to tell my own story for my own sake. I needed to do it, but I don't believe in logs falling in the forest, looking at themselves in a mirror. <laughs> that goes nowhere fast. That log is not communicating. It's not expressing itself. It's not being creative. It's keeping its good stuff to itself. Uh, not my style, not anymore. Not after I got through and survived my first childhood and went on to part two, 60s going on 70s. Guess what that part of the book is about? 
Um, yes, obviously, uh, my, my um, rediscovering my voice at Mumford High School. You didn't have to go to Mumford to appreciate what I experienced there that gave me permission to uh, rediscover my good stuff and to share it with, with others. It changed my life. And what else is in part two? Oh, in LA, I promise not to tell. I'm not gonna say too much about that. That's my little secret. You'll have to buy the book because everyone thinks I graduated from Mumford, went to Wayne for a while. Oh, spent a little time in LA. And then I started the fifth estate. Not true. In LA, I promise not to tell. And you're gonna have to read the chapter to find out who did I make what promise not to tell what, but it really impacted my life and changed how comfortable I felt about um, letting the cat out of the bag after all these years. Ah, 60s going on 70s. You can't print that. My life in the underground press. Three guesses. The first three don't count. I get drafted and meet the man with three hearts. Loved writing that. Loved writing it. Because that's a part of my history, a part of my story that no one knows anything about. Unless you worked with me at Lafayette Clinic. Okay. Or you were a patient of mine when I was an attendant nurse at Lafayette Clinic, because in the big war, I was drafted, became a conscientious objector and a nursing attendant. Or you're my wife, Catherine. Who? <laughs> She's a civilian. She goes nowhere, no professional events. She stays home and we take care of each other and we're cocoonists and we like it like that. So I really enjoyed writing. I get drafted to meet the man with three hearts because that's where I met the love of my life. She was a nurse. I thought she was a nun. She thought I was a patient. <laughs> it was a perfect match, eventually. Eventually. FM. Oh, man, I love this. FM. I didn't know radio could do that. That's what happened after I was released from my CO duty. And then, of course, exit wounds. Uh, the end of the 60s going into the 70s. My decision to not fight the establishment, not fight the flow, but to join. Hippie Harvey, <laughs> Hippie Harvey sells out. That was one of the headlines in the free press when it was learned my decision to uh, enter part three of the book. They shoot pictures, don't they? Again, you can imagine what that's about. Uh, my experiences and my adventures working at uh, Channel 4 and Channel 7, Channel 56, starting my own production company, and um, learning how to become a screenwriter. And then part four is, an, I have so many favorite parts. Uh, it's called the impossible is hard. I don't, I didn't, don't want to never have in my classroom and with my interns and with my staff romanticized the creative uh, process, the experience of self-expression. Um, it's exhilarating when it's not terrifying it's exhausting when it's not intoxicating. So I wrote part four called Impossible is Hard. All the experiences um, that one has to go through um, to survive and endure and, um, and thrive. And having your cake and eat it too, to be a creative, artistic, self-expressed person and earn a living doing it. How do you do that? I didn't know. I had to learn the hard way. I had always been a self-learner. I had an experiential learner. I had to find out by doing it. That's how I learned. Um, let's see, we're going to take questions shortly, but I do want to read another excerpt um, from the book because <laughs> I think it'll speak to your interests as well as mine. See if you can recognize the main character. But first, hang on. Cheers. I feel like I'm having a Zoom meeting with my grandson. I mean, cheers, Toby. When she played Detroit in the early 70s, Bette Midler told her adoring fans at Masonic Temple how impressed she was with playing in the city of Detroit because she's never, and these are her words, not mine, she never met so many people who knew how to make the best out of such an impossible situation. Gotta love it, gotta love it. We laugh because it was true and that's just how we roll in Detroit. We know how to make the best, not always happy about it, 
not always looking forward to it, not always embracing the process of making something out of nothing. In, in Detroit, our magic is topsy-turvy. <laughs> in this town, uh, now you don't see it, and now you do. I'll repeat that. Now you don't see it, now you do. It's topsy-turvy. It's just how we roll, okay? And to prove it, uh, my own production company, I created my own independent production company, although sidebar, independent production company. <laughs> to this day, I can hear my uh, the, the ghosts of executive producers past, Henry Maldonado and Robert Woodruff, and you know who you are out there, saying, what are you talking about, Harvey? You've always been an independent producer. Why do you think we fought so much? <laughs> and we did. When we weren't learning, when I wasn't learning from them. And, um, but HKO Media was the name of my production company. And uh, we, went, along with Channel 56, WTI, DIV, and Detroit Public Television, uh, produced the documentary called The Voodoo Man of Heidelberg Street. Three guesses. <laughs> it was a documentary about Tyree Guyton, who I'm sure most of you already know, is a self-styled proponent of uh, graffiti and uh, urban art. And he made headlines in the 1980s by taking over his well, he didn't take it over. He was trying to protect his neighborhood from decay and uh, and the um, devastating blight, the impossible situations, as Bette Midler called it, that was uh, plaguing his community, his neighborhood. And his solution, I loved it, was to hang old children's bicycles and dolls and other found objects on the trees and on houses and to paint the houses, the abandoned homes, not other people's property, you know, with... Um, polka dots and squares and other wacky shapes and designs on, and even on what was left of the decaying sidewalks and the streets, even the mailboxes weren't safe from Tyree and the Voodoo Man of Heidelberg Street. By the way, I've never told this to anybody. Why did we call it the Voodoo Man of Heidelberg Street? <laughs> because that's what the kids called him in, in their neighborhood. They didn't know who this guy was. Picking up the brush, picking up the pen, picking up the paper, picking up the, uh, picking up the trash and putting it on walls and riding bicycles. The, they, they thought he was the one child in particular, I forgot his name, he called him the voodoo man of Heidelberg Street. Henry Maldonado, my executive producer, when we weren't fighting said, that's the name of your story. And he was right. Okay. So we're gonna take questions in about two minutes. We left time for 10, but I don't believe in that. I want to take as many as I can. So get ready. We're going to do this. But I want to say this about Tyree um, and about why, what drew me. Uh, often what brings us to the table. I always ask myself, I ask my interns or my collaborators, what brings you to the table? Uh, I know you want to do a documentary about deer hunting, but what brings you to the table? Reitman W. A. <laughs> when I was at the Gross Point Academy, I created Reitman, so like acronyms that stand for suggestions or observations or things that writers, it's like vitamins, it's like vitamins for creative and creative people. So Reitman W. A. Ashley, what a great essay you wrote. I, I really enjoyed reading your essay, but where uh, you need to take some more W. A. Where's Ashley? Where are you? in your essay, where are you? It's one thing to observe. Um, how about a little reflection? How about putting a little Ashley in your essay, in your paper, right in WA. So what brought me to the table for Voodoo Man of Heidelberg Street? <laughs> it's a joke, an old joke. And I know many of you have heard it before. Uh, two boys, two kids, twins, I think, depending on, a, if it's Mel Brooks or Woody Allen or whoever tells it, in a room full of horse manure. And the one boy is hysterical, pulling his hair out, you know, just screaming and ripping off his clothes, going nuts, whining, wailing at the, howling at the moon. And his brother, meanwhile, was on his all fours, digging, scratching the surface, digging, burrowing, looking uh, strenuously, excitedly for something. And his brother said, what are you nuts? What are you looking for? We're in a, 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 a room full of manure. Yes, 
Yes, the brother said. Okay, you know the punchline, but here it comes anyway. So there must be a pony. <laughs> I know where I am. I'm in a room for a horse, but there must be a pony. And that's how I feel. It's how Tyree feels. It's how I feel. I'm sure it's how you feel. It's what brings you to the table. Okay. And if I can help you find your good stuff and share your pony with others, I'm fine. I'm good. Okay, questions. I think John's around somewhere. And thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. This has been fun. Hi, John. I'm here. Hi, we do have some questions. I'm ready. Um, let's bring it back to the beginning. There's a question from Sarah who asks for those of us not from Detroit, can you tell us about your underground newspaper? Yes. Well, I've always published underground newspapers. When I was 10 or 11, I published the Transylvania fan scene. <laughs> oh, that was great. That was scary. Um, and I always uh, loved publishing. Writing, by the way, is thrilling. But pales compared to publishing, sharing that good stuff with others. So it was an underground paper. It was uh, back in the old days, in the straight press and the corporate press and the papers that your parents, or maybe you, read, you know, uh, black people were generally, unless they were in trouble, relegated God knows where, or invisible. Young people were certainly invisible, maybe on the teen page or on the front page if they were rowdy and were JDs if they were juvenile delinquents. And in terms of um, music, generally covered the top 40 radio stations. Um, and um, the underground press was our way of saying, you know what? Women don't have to be confined to the uh, features section <laughs> or the home section. We, pr we printed a newspaper for the hippies, the politicos, the druggies, you know, just all kinds of people, young people, old people in the 60s. Many of us were harassed by the same police, spied on, the Fifth Estate certainly was, by the state police and the FBI, and we were being arrested, John Sinclair, ask him anything. We were all being harassed and observed by the same uh, nemeses. So why not print a newspaper that really was a bridge, reached out and spoke to all each of these sections of, um, the community, but that became known as the underground or the count. Time Magazine called it the underground. We eventually called it the counterculture. At Plum Street, I called it the, <laughs> the over-the-counter culture. Um, so um, that gives you a hint. That's the underground press. It's also alternative press because we printed stuff that nobody else cared about in the corporate press. Anti-war, civil rights demonstrations, gay stuff, feminist stuff. You know, you don't get that in, in our case, the Detroit News or the Free Press. The Free Press, press a little, but not much. And it's certainly not in the Detroit News. So we had to make our own. Uh, Desiree Cooper, uh, a friend and a, a colleague, uh, once asked me um, about the underground press. And I said, the underground press, okay, the straight press was like a hand mirror. That they held up only what they knew and what they saw and what was in front of their face. The underground press, and there are thousands of them, and, hundreds of thousands of readers, high schools, students, uh, veterans, everybody who could print a newspaper back in the day. We were among the first. Um, what was my point? I just got lost. I was about to make a really good point. Can I have some help here? Hold up some, <laughs> no, you yeah. can't. Anyway, you get my point, you get my drift. It was alternative because we had no alternative. Not only was the news alternative, if we want to get the word out, of what we valued and what was important, our good stuff collectively, we had to print our own papers. And I did. And Peter Werby, I started the paper, but of course, Peter Werby, my colleague of over the years, saved it in Maryland. That's chapter, what, 14? <laughs> there is a question about that. There's a, there's a question, um, if you could tell the story of how the Fifth Estate was started, but also how Peter Werby factors in. Well, gosh. There wouldn't be, a, um, you know, the historical museum did a 50th anniversary several years ago, commemorating the anniversary, the half century anniversary of the paper and MOCAD did a, an exhibit as well. None of that would have happened if it wasn't for Peter and Marilyn. I was a student at Wayne Monteith College, along with Dave Marsh and Bob Fleck and, and others. Um, and I was burning both ends of the candle and I couldn't, I couldn't major in journalism at Wayne at Monteith while learning about 
Gutenberg's Bible and the history of photo offset printing. And um, while I was publishing my newspaper the, uh, with a circulation of 3,000, I couldn't. I was, I, I was Friday. I was burned out. And I went to the Detroit Committee to end the war in Vietnam. I see a lot of nodding there. You're welcome. Um, and I said, I'm done. I, I, I need help. Unless I can get a staff, unless we can get some support, this is our last issue, which was painful to them because that's how they got their word out about their demonstrations. Nobody stood up. Peter Werby raised his hand. I didn't know who he was. Apparently he knew who I was because he bought a paper at the Monte Cinema Guild screening once and he knew who I was and the paper. He didn't know we were in trouble because I didn't tell anybody. I kept that to myself, that part of the good stuff until I couldn't hold it in anymore. I had to let it go. And Peter said, I'll help. And he, he joined up and Marilyn did. And, and then it got viral, got contagious. And then John Sinclair, and then Lenny Sinclair, and then scads of photographers and, and artists and writers and journalists, real journalists, who, who by day worked for the other papers. And by night, I'm not, I'm not naming names, don't worry. They were uh, delivering alternative news. Denise um, writes, um, what was the pivotal point from where you went from anti-establishment to the establishment? Was sure, a certain, that's easy. A certain age or event? Yes, the event. You know, in, in, in screenwriting, we talk about spins. Spins are something that happen. They're plot points that are so major and so significant that they change everything. Michael Corleone, you know, his father gets shot. He has to step up. Uh, Luke Skywalker, his uncle and aunt, get murdered by Darth Vader. Changes everything, okay? Um, for me, I was drafted in 1968. And I didn't want to fight in Vietnam. I didn't want to go to prison. I didn't want to go to Canada. I wanted to serve my country. And I thought the best way to do that was to become a conscientious objector. I was drafted. Became a CO, an attendant nurse at Lafayette Clinic. It was an upside down bizarro world. These people, these patients were hallucinating and they didn't, they didn't want to. That was so un, out of character in the fifth estate world. <laughs> people hallucinated and couldn't get high enough. But at Lafayette Clinic, these were sick and disturbed and unwell people. And I, I learned a lot about mental illness from my experience there. One of the psychiatrists, he was known as the rebel psychiatrist, Victor Bloom. You're welcome, David. You're welcome, Blooms. Dobies, um, watched me try to talk a paranoid schizophrenic out of having three hearts. And so Dr. Bloom took me aside in the nursing station. He said, you know, Mr. Oshinsky, he had a goatee. Uh, the next time you try to talk a, a paranoid uh, schizophrenic out of having three hearts, you better be uh, prepared to replace the other two. Check. We were off and running. Bo. To answer the question, how I ultimately, because I left ultimately Lafayette Clinic um, to work at ABX um, and to start Open City, which is another part of the chapter, um, I found myself changing and growing and learning things that I didn't learn on the street, that I couldn't learn from Peter, I couldn't learn from Frank Choice, I couldn't learn from Timothy Leary, you know, or, or Kunstler. There was an alternative universe at Lafayette Clinic that exposed me to uh, a new way of thinking and growing. And eventually I asked Dr. Bloom to take me on as a patient. This rebel psychiatrist took this rebel rubble on as a patient. It's a long story, but it's, I, had, I had my reasons and I go into great detail about why I chose that. And as a result of that and the relationship I had with my wife after I came out of therapy to try to understand what I was so afraid of being that close to uh, someone I loved and cared for, um, I felt like one of those lobsters. I remember reading about the lobsters off the uh, northern coast of near San Francisco, where they grow so fast, uh, their skin, their, their armor doesn't have time to grow with them, and they kind of uh, implode with, they're crushed by the weight of their own armor. That's how I felt when I left Lafayette Clinic, worked at ABX, and decided I would, ah, earn a living get a real job, Hippie Har Harvey sells out again. And I went to work for Channel 7. The rest is uh, chap uh, part three. They shoot pictures, don't they? I hope I'm answering the questions because I tend to uh, go inter 
constellational. I go from Venus to Mars to Saturn to Pluto. And, but my students, I see you nodding. My students are used to this. I, I always assign one person in the class every day, remind me where we left off because I will forget. No, I think you're, I think you're 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 doing a phenomenal job answering these questions. Okay, you're you're my you're you're running you're, you're my spot guy. Um, well, we I think we'll we'll transition to some of the more historical questions to some of the questions um, about people asking for advice. So Good. Um, love it. The first one um, that we'll ask is uh, Victor writes: Is there anything you'd like to tell a burgeoning author? Anything yes. you think? someone who wants to share a story should know before doing so. Before what? Before doing so. Oh, nothing. Anything, anything you, should, you think someone who wants to share a story should know before doing okay. so, sharing a story. The first thing a writer needs to do, the first most important first rule, and I have hundreds of them, is to have something to say. The content. You know, the, the platform doesn't make any difference. The media, the formatting, I don't care where you choose to express yourself. My, my grandson, I'm about to go to Mars. I'm going to need you, John. Bring me back but where I'm leaving off of. My grandson, Toby, you know, used to love drawing. And then he discovered uh, chalk. And then, he, and then he discovered finger painting. I mean, like his Napa, <laughs> he's not particular about how he chooses or where he chooses to express himself. So I would tell... Victor, is it? Victor, the way to become an author, I will tell you what Rod Serling told me. I was 13 years old, publishing the Transylvania newsletter. I wanted to be good at it. I wanted to earn a living. I wrote Rod Serling, the creator of the Twilight Zone. Who are you? What are you? Where'd you come from? How, do, how does someone like me? I was Victor. <laughs> Probably much younger than you are now, Victor. How do I become you? What advice can you give me? And Rod Serling, and it's in the book, uh, told me the way to become a writer is to write, among other things. So start by writing. Don't stop. Spill your beans. Spill your guts. Um, buy the book. I, I'm not just. I'm. I, I don't. I'm not a hawkster. But this book, and I'm not the only. I'm not. I'm a, I didn't invent this. But the people who wrote the blurbs and colleagues who I respect say it's weird. In fact, I'm going to read it to you. Desiree Cooper. Sorry for knocking on the mic. I get excited when I talk about this stuff. Um, I tried not to get embarrassed when Desiree Cooper wrote this blurb on the back, uh, free press columnist, a Pulitzer Prize nominee, an amazing filmmaker in her own right. Leave it to Harvey of Shinsky to create a new genre, the biotext, where memoir meets textbook with its mix of life struggles, creative escapades, and production war stories. Scratching the surface reads like a fireside chat with a storytelling sage. I'll be keeping this trove of inspiration and pull its inspiration and concrete advice on my writing desk for years to come. That's just the surface offhand, Victor. Um, write, read the book, read more books, don't stop writing, and don't take it personally when people don't see or value what you see and what you value in your work. And uh, that's where the textbook comes in. The lessons are here throughout the book, not just in one chapter or one part of the book than the other. I wish I had time to go into more detail. I wish I was your teacher. I would, you, would you like to do an internship? No, I'm just kidding, because I'm done with <laughs> I, I loved passing this stuff on. Well, there is a question for you to go deeper. I mean, there's Diane writes, um, can you expand on the idea of the quote, good stuff? Why yes. do I want to talk slash write about the good stuff? Well, you may not want to. Uh, a lot of people don't want to do it. A lot of people would rather. The good stuff is not a value judgment. It's not positive stuff. It can be sad or scary or hostile or angry or uh, mournful or grievous. The point is the good stuff is who you are. You can't control it. Uh, you can't control it. You can't structure it. The good stuff is how you feel. It's what you value. It's what you, what's important to you. And um, I just think that we don't think that people care about our good stuff. And for them, and we have no experience, by the way. <laughs> Can you imagine going around? I used to tell my students at the, um, at Madonna and also the College for Creative Studies, you know, can you imagine what would happen if we went around one day expressing ourselves 
telling the truth, revealing our good stuff, striking our skin, letting it out. Can you imagine what would happen to it? And of course they knew, because my fourth graders knew exactly what would happen. Splat with our eels. So we don't have a lot of practice. It's not our fault. We just don't have a lot of practice. Um, um, Vitamin DSGF was very helpful to my uh, eighth graders. Vitamin DSGF, don't stop, go further. Okay, so the good stuff is there, it's innate. Whether it's active or proactive or reactive or snoozing, that's your choice. But I happen to believe that we all have an inherent, and this is where my first child comes in. If I could do it under my circumstances, anybody can do it. And so there are lessons to be learned from how I learned to hide my good stuff. And by the way, it was a good thing I did. It, it was a good thing. You know, dep depressed children take a lot of flack because they're so sad and depressed. Are you kidding? Depression is a, is a cover, it's a cave, it's a protective way of being in the world. It, it's a shelter. It doesn't feel good. It's not good for you but we all find ways to protect our good stuff. It's hard to explain in 10 minutes. How do we do, John? Uh, Diane, are we okay? <laughs> I think that's, I think that's a, a, a good answer. You wanna, you wanna leave people wanting a little bit more. So. Oh, there's so much more. <laughs> um, I think we have time for just a few more questions. And so I'm more gonna the better, John. You got it. So I'm gonna switch to some questions. Um, to get us to the top of the hour here um, that uh, are more reflective on your process of writing the book itself. So yes. moving away from your history to advice to reflecting on writing this book, Ellen Bates Brackett writes, uh, great Are you to kidding? See you. Ellen, hi. So it's great to see you, Harvey, be well. Uh, she writes, how was the process of revealing yourself to yourself? Was it scary? Yeah. Well, for one thing, it, I didn't do it by myself. That's where the rebel psychiatrist came in. That's where Dr. Bloom came in. I was in therapy for six years to work this and other things out. And when you read the book, you'll get it. Not just because of the first, my first childhood, but for other incidents and episodes that took place in my life, which hmm, led me to keeping my good stuff to myself. And, uh, but when you fall in love, you can't do that. <laughs> you, you have to take some chances and you have to go there. So anyway, Ellen, I forgot what the question is, but it doesn't happen by itself. I went into therapy. I tried to figure out, you know, how, where, where, who was I? Where was I? Where did this come from? How much was it my fault? How much was it not my fault? Who do I blame? Who do I forgive? How do I move on? It's not, a, I don't want to make it seem like it's a button. I remember Dr. Fauci said, it's not like we're going to turn on the light and suddenly um, the pandemic will be gone. It doesn't work that way. Uh, understanding that we have it, accepting that we do, and deciding what you choose to do about it, internally or externally or both, um, that's your decision. It's why I wrote the book. I, I kept all this stuff to myself. I I. Tyree Guyton, bring it, bring it on, you know. Um, Tammy Bacamino, bring him on. Father Maloney from Pole Town, bring him on. Uh, Donald Lobsinger, <laughs> when I did the uh, night Martin Luther King came to Gross Point, the doc, bring them on. I'll ask anybody all the deep questions. Lawrence, one of my favorite interviews. Lawrence, chapter six or seven, I forget. Uh, when I was at Channel Seven doing a documentary about the convicts at uh, Jolt Prison blew my mind, his answer to what I thought was a trivial question uh, helped send me along the way to asking even uh, more questions. I don't know if I answered these questions. Oh, that you are, you, you, you have this way of thinking you're not answering these questions okay. or saying that you're forgetting these questions well, and then you're, not you're brilliantly I'm... answering them. No. Uh, each time. Um, Thank but you. I love it. You're kind. By the way, uh, I feel like I'm on the radio. Hi, you're on Fair <laughs> Change. Hi, you're on Night Call. Hi, it's up against the wall. <laughs> that was my first show on ABX. You're a great uh, screener, a great producer, John. Thank you. So if you ever want to change professions, we need you at Literati. You're very good at this. <laughs> um, Cheryl writes, um, if you were writing chapters about the last four years, 
what huh. would your what would your musings be? Well, it'd have to be about the writing of the book. Someone asked me, did the pandemic help? You know, all that time you had on your hands to write? No, I've always written as if I lived in a pandemic. <laughs> Anti-social, it's why I didn't go to parties with my colleagues and my peers. I'm from the Elmore Leonard School of, 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 of Writing and Creativity. I got up at 5.30 in the morning. And to my wife's dismay, sometimes much earlier to get the work done before I put on my suit and went to work at Channel 7 or Channel 4 or Channel 56. So um, the last four years was spent scratching the surface. Uh, <laughs> a shout out to Ronit Wagman. I, Ronit, I don't know if you're listening, but uh, she's my developmental editor. Oh, and with a lot of help. Then I had Rod Sterling, now I have Ronit Wagman and my interns and everybody else who supported my work. But Ronit, what was my developmental um, editor? And she really kicked my butt regarding structure and content and helped make the, the, the book become what it was. <laughs> uh, butt naked <laughs> was her rally cry. Butt naked. Oh, and Ellen, you'll appreciate this and any other Mustangs that are out there. Because when I transferred from all white, spanky new, clean Henry Ford High School, one of the first white kids to ever leave Ford to go to Mumford, hello. Bloom used to say, I'm like a, a fireman. I always, firemen, most people leave burning bridge uh, houses. I always go right in. So I went, left Ford, went to Mumford. And um, what was my point, John? Where was I going with this? Oh, well, it escapes me. Sorry, it was a good point too. That's one of the disadvantages of interplanetary space travel when you're being interviewed by people you want to be honest with. I'm a poor screener because I was trying to queue up the next question here. So I, <laughs> okay, but maybe you, maybe maybe those of you who are listening and watching can fill in, imagine where I was trying to go. What was, uh, what was the question? Ronate Wagman, someone, right? Oh, Ronit, yes, butt naked. Thank you. You're hired, John. Thank you, so, Marcy. Actually, Marcy, my, Marcy with the safe there. Marcy, yes, Ronit's mom. <laughs> They're so proud of each other. Anyway, so butt naked, and she wasn't making it up. That's what my gym teacher told me. I went to Mumford my first days. I said, is it true that we're swimming in the nude? Boys swim in the nude? And he said, I don't know what they taught you at Henry Ford, Henry frigging Ford, Mr. Upshinsky, but here at Mumford, we swim butt naked. <laughs> And, and that's how I tried to write in the last four years, but naked. Didn't always feel good, didn't always enjoy it. Some parts were harder than others. And I think people who have read the book can imagine which were the more painful, the more difficult ones. But um, he, my gym teacher was right, Ronit was right. And I was right to listen to them. Listen to people, don't keep yourself to yourself. Listen to people, look, here you are listening to this, reading the book. Listen to people who know more than, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. Learn from others who know more about what you're interested in, what you care about than what you do. That's great advice. Um, I think we have time for one more question. All right. Um, uh, and- While you think about it, can I give a plug? Uh, yeah. Next Tuesday, Peter Werby and I are talking, recalling our back pages, our times with the Fifth Estate, at an event very similar to this at BookBeat, at BookBeat, at Literati. Next Tuesday night, check it out on my Facebook or on Peter's Facebook page. And become and, a Facebook, uh, fan or friend or whatever we, on my author's page. And if we didn't have a chance to get to your question uh, tonight, I'm sure you can get to your question uh, at that event. Yes. So those of you who I didn't get to, I'm so sorry. There's so many wonderful questions here, um, but I'm trying to go in, in, in order and theme. And so I have one more question, I think. Let me just say that a lot of people who, who are listening can message me and I'll do my best to answer the question. Great, Facebook. wonderful, wonderful. Um, I don't want to leave you hanging. We'll, we'll leave you with uh, uh, Harvey with an, es an esoteric question to me, but perhaps there's a story behind it. And if there's not, I can maybe find another final question. But uh, Frederick well, writes... If it's important to you, it might be important to me and for others. Frederick writes, um, have you made use of your decoder ring recently? <laughs> yes, I have it somewhere. It's on the... I don't only have, I don't only have books here. I got decoder rings <laughs> up the wazoo at ABX. All oh, the stories we could tell. Never made it to the book. But 
Um, they were decoder rings like Sergeant Preston of the Yukon used to wear in Wheaties boxes. And uh, at ABX, the jocks, I don't know if they were high or what, but we thought it'd be a great idea to have a decoder ring and send out secret messages on the air. I was the news guy. What do I know? But the, but the jocks did it. And it was fun. I do have it. I don't use it. I've spent my whole life trying to decode. I should have used it. I could have used it during the writing of the book. Would have saved me some grief. There you go. Um, well, great. I was assuming there was a great story behind that, and there was. Um, always. Always a great story. But uh, that's we're at the top of the hour. So oh, Har Harvey Oshinsky, thank you. We could go another hour, I know. I know, but, I know. But thank you so much for joining us tonight at, at Home with Literati. Um, it's a pleasure to have you. I forgot to mention, I mentioned it in the chat. If you want your book signed, uh, leave us a comment when you're checking out. Um, and uh, we'll take care of the rest. And Harvey will come down to the store and we'll have him sign some outside, nice and safe. Um, I may not and, be there at the time, but I will sign the books. We'll arrange a time. So just leave us a note of who you want it inscribed to. And, yeah. and, and we'll, we'll do all the rest and we'll let you know when your book is signed. I would look ready forward to, to that. Thank up. you. Um, but Harvey, thanks again for joining us. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us as well. We hope you all continue to stay safe and be well. And we'll, we'll see you at the next event. So take so care long. and have a great night. John. Bye, John. Bye, Bye guys. all. See ya.